Your broadcast coming to you from Karen, where media houses are this evening having a conversation with the Azimio presidential candidate Raila Odinga and his running mate, Martha Karua. This is a special broadcast being brought to you by several media houses. My name is Eric Lati from KTN. I have my colleagues, Francis Gashuri from Citizen. The conversation is also live on K24, and Alan Owino is here from K24. It's also live on KBC, represented by Nancy Okware, and it's also live on NTV. Melita Oletengas is here with us. This conversation is also being transmitted live on several radio stations across the country. Welcome for this conversation, and welcome, Your Excellency Raila and Martha. Thank you. We'll have an interesting conversation, starting from what you've been having you know, around the country in terms of your campaign corruption and the fight against corruption. We'll also have uh, a conversation about your promises, some of the campaign promises that you're making around the country, social protection, health, education. We'll also talk about unemployment and what you have programmed for the youth. And then we'll talk about the current campaign politics and how you are managing that. And then we will talk about integrity and accountability. Right? That is a good enough topic, Martha? Yes, it is. And we can also say that we, you've been saying that Raira uh, <laughs> Nimzarendo. <laughs> and uh, that this is the kind of campaign that you've been having, you know, Haro going around the country and even meeting people who are making fun of you and engaging with them one on one. The Haro is theirs, uh -huh. but we use hello a lot when the crowd is making noise. Right. Yeah, but everybody is entitled to enjoy whichever, whether by mimicking, whether by uh, their memes, mm -hmm. you're entitled to enjoy. And then there are those who also mimic you, Baba, when you come onto the stage and the first thing he says is, Haya, Haya, <laughs> to get the crowd to attention. And you've stopped doing the Kitenda Wheelie. Why? I've not really stopped doing the Kitenda Wheelie. I, I just don't do it as often as I used to do. Um, uh, but sometimes I use it when I want to bring a point home. Then I use it in the wheel. It's not that I don't use it because some people have accused me of when I get in the wheel. That is not really the reason. <laughs> yeah. We have just transitioned from now doing it and really to doing the dance. Yes. It, it's a new. It's a new Raila. Exactly. Okay. Sometimes you metamorphose. <laughs> Let's get into the conversation, Francis. Great. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Odila, <coughs> Madam Karua. The very fundamental question on many people's minds tonight is the cost of living. Um, you're addressing, you're seeking votes from people who are barely uh, surviving. The cost of living, cost of unga, cost of fuel, and all the other costs are, are, are rising fundamentally. And um, in the very short run, in the interim, because you have... President Uhuru Kenyatta's here um, and the government's here. What in the interim would be your proposal to reduce the cost of living and make life easier for many Kenyans? That is in the short run. But in the long run, what would be your promises? What would be your plan in the event you're elected president in August? Well, um, because there, if you look at really the cost of it, uh, I see some people who are really trying to divide attention of the public, playing populist politics with the cost of living. But the facts are that, one, I think you had uh, like a crop failure. You did not harvest enough uh, to be able to satisfy the demands, the needs of the country. Uh, secondly, there have been other events which have taken place in other parts of the world which themselves are major contributory factors to the rise in cost of living, not only in Kenya, but around the world. Even see the USA is fighting it. Uh, European countries right now are having serious problems uh, because of what is happening in Ukraine uh, there. So uh, there, are, there are factors beyond the actual control of, of the government. But you can actually um, die, uh, make some, some adjustments when you, for example, cut down on certain expenditures and, and then focus on feeding the people, uh, making it much more bear, bearable uh, for the local person in the country. 
And you're really talking about basically just essential uh, commodities like the, the cost of onga, which everybody talks about, the price of sugar or the price of cooking oil uh, and also uh, petrol and, and so on. Uh, you can, uh, by looking at the, the budget and making some adjustments in terms of uh, uh, expenditure, both recurrent and uh, development, you can be able to make some adjustments. Okay. Mushuma Mada, swali hilo hilo, garama ya maisha. Bila shaka unatafuta kura, ama unatafuta kura na Mushuma Odinga, na watu wanakuambia kuhusu njaa wanakuambia kuhusu gharama ya maisha na wanahitaji suluhisho kuna suluhisho la muda huu kwa sasa ili wakienda kupiga kura mwezi wa nane angalau swala hilo liwe limeshughulikiwa japo kwa kiasi kidogo kwa sasa tuelewe azmio haiko kwa serikali jubilee ambayo iko kwa serikali ni chama moja baina ya vyama sita za muungano wa asimio lakini ni kweli iko uhusiano mzuri kati ya kinara wangu na rais aliyeko. Kwa hivyo wananchi waelewe hatuwezi kama asmio kuamua ni vipi. Lakini tukichukua mamlaka na Mungu atusaidie na wananchi tuchukue. Tumepeana ahadi ya kwamba kwa siku mia moja za kwanza gharama ya maisha itateremshwa. Na ziko jia kadhaa kufanya hivyo na kinara wangu ashaelezea na hii si mara ya kwanza gharama ya maisha imejaribiwa kuletwa chini na serikali wakati tulikuwa kwa serikali ya rais Kibaki tukiwa na kinara wangu serikali ilijaribu kuleta gharama ya maisha chini na kufanya um, kutafuta mbinu za kupatia wenye viwanda vya kusiaga unga Uh, mahindi kwa bei nafuu ndivyo unga ishuke ziko njia kadhaa za kufanya hivyo na tumepeana hiyo ahadi wa sasa ile tunaweza tu ni pengine kinara wangu kuongea na mwenzake lakini mkumbuke hizi ni ziku za mwisho mwisho na hatujui mipango ya ndani ya serikali Mshumo Odingo umejaribu kumweleza rais moja kwa moja kuhusu swala hili unapoenda maeneo mbalimbali kutafuta kura ukamwambia labda watu wanasema hivi kuhusu gharama ya maisha watu wanasema hivi kuhusu bei ya vyakula na labda kama ana suluhisho la muda kabla iwapo utakuwa unachaguliwa kama rais uchukue usukani ama mwingine yote ambaye atakuwa anachaguliwa kuwa rais sitaki kuongea kwa niaba ya serikali Eh, lakini mimi ningependa kusema ati ni kweli tumezungumzia mambo haya na mimi najua uh, hakuna changamoto zingine maana kibili na bijua shida wako naye ni kwamba serikali haitembei pamoja iko nusu ya serikali ambayo inapinga yale ambayo serikali inajaribu kufanya wao wanacheza siasa na maisha ya wakenya Uh, ati wao wanasema wao ndio wanasuluhu wakipewa uh, atamu ya uongozi katika nchi hii wataremsha gharama ya maisha chini sasa unauliza wewe uko katika cabinet baraza ya mawaziri na hiyo baraza ya mawaziri ndiyo inatoa uamuzi yale ambayo nitakanya ifanyike baba hayuko katika cabinet uh, naweza tu kutoa ushauri kwa rais mwenyewe lakini yeye mwenyewe na wenzake ndio wako katika serikali kwa hivyo sisi tumeweza kupitoa pendekezo lakini sa zingine wanapata ugumu hapa na pale ambao mimi mwenyewe siwezi kuyaingia mm -hmm. e, lakini sisi tunaweza kuongea juu yale tutafanya na mimi naweza kuhakikishia wa Kenya ati ahadi ambayo tumetoa sio mzaha ni ahadi ambayo tunajua ni deni kwa wa Kenya maana sio mara ya kwanza sisi kuwa katika serikali tuliingia katika serikali wakati hali ya uchumi ilikuwa mbaya zaidi 
na vile vile wakati ile um, e, yani mambo ya ufisadi ilikuwa juu zaidi toka tupoingia huko uh, tena tukasitukua tumeahidi wa Kenya tutaleta somo la bure ya ya primary Shuri. na tupoingia na imna hii tukaanza kutekeleza somo la bure na vile vile tukatafuta mbinu ya kuleta kazi ya kwa vijana ambaye ilisaidia vijana kupata pesa kidogo kwa mfukoni mwao kama ile kazi mtaani ambayo sasa inaitwa na hiyo ilikuwa inafanywa katika um, pembe zote za, za taifa ikasaidia vijana kukua na pesa ambayo wanaweza kuwa kutumia kununua chakula na vile vile tukaagiza mahindi kutoka ngambo tukalipa sisi kama serikali na tuka uh, lazimisha uh, NCPB kuuza hizo mahindi kwa bei nafuu kwa mtambo za kusaga uh, mahindi ili gharama ga, ga, bei ya, 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 ya unga irudi chini kwa wananchi na ilifanyika uh, na, na mpaka hiyo iliendelea mpaka baadaye tulipokuwa na mavuno chakula ya karudi sawa sawa na, na gharama ya, ya bei ya chakula ya karudi chini. Kwa hivyo uh, kuna njia ya kuifanya haya. Kuna njia ya kufanya haya na sisi tuna hakika tukiingia katika serikali ndani ya siku mia moja ili tumeahidi tutapunguza gharama ya maisha kwa wakenya wote. Allow me to wrap this up with uh, one question. While well, you say you're not in government and that could be the case um, but there are your critics will say since the handshake you have some level of leverage the assumption um, does that in any way uh, give you some extra baggage in terms of looking for votes well aware of some of the challenges that the government has experienced especially in the second term does it in any way affect your search for votes you know Kenyans are basically not, not stupid my competitors are saying that uh, the, uh, ni, the stability died in Kenya and was buried. Kenya know very well that I'm not in government. I don't earn a salary in government. I don't live in government house. Uh, I don't get any allowance from government. But I advise, I can give some advice. And advice, as you know, is just what it is. I mean, it is not uh, implementable. Uh, the, use, the, the, the receiver can use it or cannot use it. Um, I, but having been in government, I also know the challenges which uh, a government also faces. Uh, like this crisis we are in right now, it's a serious crisis. Uh, you can see the way the cost of crude or oil has, has gone up. You know, it has, and when the cost of oil goes up, virtually everything else goes up in a country. Uh, we know that, that, that for a fact because everything else depends on, on, on oil in terms of manufacturing. So um, uh, it is unfair really to, to just do a blanket blame government. Somebody who is earning a salary has got over 250 security of government defending him. Uh, is. Uh, using government vehicles and, and uh, equipment to do the campaign. To come out and say he's not in government, it ask Mutwa Kitendawili, the Anajua Ye in the Akundani and Sirikali, Mimi Litoleo Kosirikali. Come with Litoleo Kosirikali, you do the decent thing that most responsible people do, you resign. That is what um, but Mr. Bill Kagia did. That is what Jeremogi Ogingo Dinga did. You resign and then you become an ordinary person. But you don't say you are out of government and you are blaming that same government, but you are earning the salary from the same government. If that is not hypocrisy, then I don't know what hypocrisy is. I what think if, I, I, if yes. I may add yes. Yes. just a little, you can't also choose which part of government you will claim credit for and which part you disown. 
if somebody is standing in the podium and telling people that I've influenced this to happen in government, they must also take the blame for any shortcoming of government. And that's the way it is. We'll come back into the politics of the campaign and the back and forth and who bears what responsibility as we continue this conversation. There's something that you've, you've touched on there, uh, Mishim which is on social protection, protecting the vulnerable, and cash transfer program like you implemented earlier. You have been promising 6,000 shillings in campaign rallies in the public. Now, there's a lot of misconception and misunderstanding of what this 6,000 shillings is all about. Who qualifies for 6,000 shillings? When do they start receiving 6,000 shillings? In fact, when we promote this uh, interview this evening, somebody already sent us a message saying that we ask you for 2,000 shillings. Deposit. Deposit. Alafu takata. King here, Serkan. So who qualifies? What is six, this 6,000 shillings for? Who qualifies for it? Let me say this. First, there are the facts and there are also jokes uh, about it. The fact is that we are talking about a social protection program. And it's not being introduced in this country, uh, I mean, only in the world. It is something that exists in other countries in the world. Like in the UK, most European countries, United States, I've seen it's in Brazil, on the continent, it is in Egypt, it is also in Namibia. In fact, we have a Kenyan who helped to design the Namibian program, who is the one who has actually worked with our experts here. Uh, and what we're talking about is a number of Kenyans who live below the poverty line. These figures are taken from the Bureau of Statistics, and they have already been profiled, about 2,000 families. When you talk about 2,000 families, you're, you're talking a family, as, uh, uh, say, four people per family. Then you're talking about um, 8 million people. And these are the people you're, you're giving money, this, the family, not individuals. Mm -hmm. And so if it's 6,000 per family for 2 million people, that's 12 uh, million um, uh, shillings. 12 billion 12 shillings. Billion. 12 billion shillings. Is it per year, per month? Per month. Per month. That works to 144 billion shillings per year. You've already costed it, okay? 144 billion shillings per year. We know, for example, the kind of pilferages and losses. The president one day talked about 2 billion shillings uh, per day that is being lost to corruption. President Obama also put it at about 700 billion equivalent Kenya shillings. Uh, so that, that is roughly what it is. And I know it has how, but most of that money is being lost through procurement, uh, particularly in, in the, uh, and, uh, through procurement and also through uh, collections. You know, uh, because the, the budget basically consists of income and, and expenditure, mm -hmm. government. Mm -hmm. You are under collecting and then you are all overspending. That is what it is. If you say about 700 billion shillings is being lost to corruption, if you basically try to block this, you can have a saving, say, of 500 billion shillings. We are talking of only 144 billion shillings. See, but we have also been in the government before. When we went into the government, we found uh, a, a, a treasury which is almost empty. The coffers are almost empty. The growth was also negative. Uh, the collection, the revenue collection was very low, generally. But, but then we immediately realized the, the cause of it. The revenue officers, the, basically were the boys in town. They're the ones who are buying apartment blocks, in town, the ones who are driving the latest model of cars, the ones who are constructing castles in the rural areas, the ones who are building high-rise buildings in village markets, and so on. 
So if we do a lifestyle audit, you'll be able to just get rid of this. And what we did, we did exactly that. We suspended them, we did a lifestyle audit, and we actually sacked some, retained those who were not very tainted, transferred them. The other side is the expenditure side of the budget. You have these so-called, uh, they, they call them procurement officers. They are all seconded into ministries from the treasury. They are the other group, like the, the, the revenue officers. Exactly the same thing. The procurement at that time uh, was being done through these officers. There's a government requirement that any procurement above 100,000 shillings had to be done competitively. In other words, you had to advertise in at least three uh, leading newspapers. Yep. And then there must be at least three bidders. And then you award to the lowest, uh, as, as it were. What we discovered was that each and every one of these procurement officers had three companies registered. And so then there was a collusion that this officer is in health, he's supplying water. This one is in water, supplying agriculture. The one in agriculture is supplying roads and so on and so forth. There's a collusion. So any time you advertise, you will get three, three bids. Mm -hmm. And all of those three bids are coming from one person. And then the, the cost is heavily inflated. Like they will be buying, uh, uh, say, uh, uh, a calendar, at which will be costing 20 shillings, be buying it 100 shillings. An item which is supposed to be costing 50 shillings is bought at 1,000 shillings. Uh, and then that amount of money is shared between these people. So you're you're saying That's how ribbon is being lost. I'm just, I'm just trying to elaborate to you mm -hmm. how the, these two billion shillings Gets lost. Lost, get lost in the government. It is not a fictitious figure. It is something that is realistic. And if you pay proper attention, mm -hmm. you can actually save that money and use that money for the kind of program that we're talking about. This is just one of them. So if, if we were to look at this 6,000 shillings, why 6,000? Why not 7? Why not 5? Why 6? 6 is uh, because this will bring these people to what, what we call the, 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 the minimum, uh, basically, uh, level. Yeah, I mean, uh, more than a, a dollar, uh, three dollars per, per day. And... Um, they will be able to, to, to live like other people. And it is not just a waste, you see, it is an investment. Because when you do this, uh, the, the people, I mean in the rural areas particularly, the purchasing power of these people go up. The shops in the rural areas can now do big business. So the economy, the rural economy itself is stimulated through this uh, amount of money. This is like an economic stimulus uh, program. It is not just a waste. With a ripple effect. Yes. My final part uh, on this particular question is, currently the government has a program called the Inua Jamii, which is a cash transfer program to the elderly, to persons with disability, severe disability, and to vulnerable and orphans. So is this a similar program? Are you going to scrap the Inua Jamii program or are you consolidating the Inua Jamii program and just adding from 2,000 shillings to 6,000 shillings? If you go into a record, you'll find that I'm the one who launched the Inua Jamii program in Mombasa when I was Prime Minister. It was really our idea to help the elderly people and also the people with disabilities and so on. Uh, those are people who are not able to really fend for themselves. And, and it, it was capped at 2,000 shillings. Uh, that is a, a separate program. These are the other group of, of people. Some of them, may, those other ones may also be included in, 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 this, in, in this group. 
but that this is over and above the Inua Jami program. This one here is targeting those specific families who have been profiled by the National Bureau of Statistics. Okay. Okay. Well, former Premier, it's a good thing you've spoken about corruption, and I believe Honorable Martha, you can just speak up after him because this is a docket that directly translates to you. Now, corruption is a big thing, as the One Kenya Coalition has spoken about, and I believe it formed the premise upon which you added that extra docket of the justice and legal affairs uh, to the deputy president when you were mentioning your shadow cabinet. Now, this would necessarily mean that the deputy president is overseeing policies and issues pertaining to the justice and legal affairs, but many would argue that in the long run it would have a ripple effect in affecting the independence of institutions such as the Office of uh, the Public Prosecutor, we have the DCI, we have the ACC. So how then would you ensure as the executive that you do not compromise on the independence of these institutions that should be so? The coach is going to talk to you about the details. Yeah. But let me just tell you that uh, we have one government. And the government now consists of three arms. You've got the executive, you've got the judiciary, and you've got the legislature. All these three arms are interdependent. If one is not working properly, efficiently, it actually affects the other arm of the government. See, so it is necessary, therefore, for these three arms of government, in spite of the independence, to also see the interdependent of, the, of them, because they are all providing services. The executive cannot perform its work if the judiciary is not, is not working. You see, if the judiciary is not working, it, it actually affects the, 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 the executive. See, when uh, you are talking about the criminals, and if these criminals are arrested, and then they are taken to court, and then they are released, uh, of course they become a drug in society. You've got how many cases have you had a criminal who was killed or was threatened to kill? I think it just about and goes and kills his mother. See, so, so something is wrong somewhere. Uh, this must be addressed. Uh, the same thing with the legislature. If uh, Parliament um, is the one that passes the laws, the executive implements the laws which Parliament has passed. They use those laws to govern the country. Then the judiciary interprets the, the laws and sees that the laws are being implemented, they're not being violated. But if the legislature makes lo wrong laws, then the executive also work is affected. So there must always be a kind of cooperation. I think people are pushing this word so-called independence too far, as if they are in different countries. Then you've got, some, like, for example, independent, you've got these commissions that we set up in the Constitution, that each one of them is now dependent on its own, you cannot interfere with what they're doing, they are, they are protected by, 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 by the Constitution, even if they're not doing their work, or if they're doing it wrongly, that there's nothing you can do about it. I don't think that is what is intended in the Constitution. You see, there's independence and there's also interdependence, generally. So, like when you talk about the criminal justice system, you've got the investigative arms of government. Then you've got the procedural uh, arm of government, the, the, the DPP. Then you've got the, 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 the judiciary, you see? So sometimes you find the police themselves collude to shield criminals. Uh, but sometimes the police have done their work. The DCI has done its work and has um, gotten sufficient evidence. The, D the DPP refuses or says this evidence is not sufficient. And, and it's, it's discretionary on dream. It refuses to, to prosecute. Uh, or then it, it takes, it agrees to prosecute, 
takes to court, then the courts themselves are compromised. And you know that courts sometimes are, are compromised. So the, the, a court that is not compromise, in my view, is worse than the criminals, because it protects the criminals. Okay? But then, uh, uh, this is a conversation I've had when I was a prime minister uh, before with the then uh, Chief Justice when we were having the, the, those problems. But that was, of course, the situation prior to the new constitution. Okay? So uh, my view is that, yes, in, independence is there, but there's also interdependence of these arms of government because ultimately you want the delivery of services to the people to be done efficiently. Okay. Well, Honorable Martha, I'm sure there's a lot of uncertainty to this role because you'll be the deputy president and there's also this additional role. And according to Article 147 for the Constitution, you cannot hold two offices. So maybe if you just respond to the same and clarify what this would mean as a member of the executive overseeing certain arms of uh, the judicial aspect. I think that's a misconception. Okay. If you look at the description of what a deputy president does, is be the principal assistant of the president mm -hmm. and perform any other duties assigned by the president. So any other duties is covered. You can hold a ministerial docket. And um, there's no difference when a deputy president holds a ministerial docket and when any other minister holds. So the framing of the question as though having a deputy president hold the Office of Justice and Constitutional Affairs Ministry is an oppressive thing, is wrong, is misleading. It is a ministerial portfolio like any other. And for people to understand um, the three arms of government, it's like pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. The three of them fall into place and make the whole. So they are independent, but interdependent. And the Justice Ministry is a coordinating ministry. It doesn't prosecute. It doesn't arrest. It doesn't uh, decide on the cases. So it's a more policy and coordination so that when uh, arms of government get together and you want to find where things are not moving, and whether we are moving according to the policy direction. And to support each other in execution, not in decision, doesn't sit in Parliament to pass that bill. But it's a government proposal. When the government, sitting with the judicial arm, asks for speedy movement of cases, it doesn't go in to determine those cases or to hear the evidence. It's talking about policy direction so that, for instance, if we need any law to limit how long certain cases can sit, then it's agreed together in a consultation. Proposals are made by the relevant department and placed forward. So there's no contradiction whatsoever. There's a meal to know that it is not a contradiction for a deputy president to have additional responsibilities assigned by the president. Okay. And that's precisely what we are talking about. And fighting corruption, if I may add, is more than just about going to court. It involves giving the public confidence that the government is serious about what it is doing so that the public can be partners in the fight against corruption. And if we wind back once and uh, go to two or two, two or three basically when uh, the NARC government came in. The public was so inspired by the zeal and the commitment of the NARC government that members of the public could actually stop policemen from receiving bribes on the roads. Members of public chose to walk to force the Matatu industry to accept the Michuki rules. Members of public recovered the Kenyatta International Conference Center from those occupying it and claiming ownership and handed it back to the relevant ministry. This is the kind of thing we are looking for.
that we will demonstrate our commitment to fighting corruption and make the public our partners in this fight. And that goes beyond just applying the law and also working seamlessly with those in the criminal justice sector, the courts, the legislature where we need uh, to um, tighten the laws, etc. Okay. Well, yeah. even as we continue with certain aspects of the manifesto that you give out as yeah. a coalition, a big and integral part of this year's election is pegged around the women factor. Yeah. And when we talk about the women factor, we talk about the two-third gender rule representation, mm -hmm. especially in the bicameral house. Now, your competitors, from the suggestions that they've been given, many have argued there's a lot of practicality, for lack of a better word. They've spoken about giving half of the government to the women. They've signed charters. They've also spoken about the first 100 days in office on your side. What is the assurance that you're giving women, despite you being, potentially being uh, the first female deputy president, what assurance are you giving people to say that, you know what, moving forward, we're going to have better representation of women in our government? It's easier said than done. For us, the commitment is demonstrated. Right now, Azimio is not saying that we will do for women ABCD. Yeah. My principal, seated right here next to me, appointed me his deputy. That's a demonstration of the commitment. So when we say that we will fulfill, we will continue the implementation of the Constitution, which includes the two-thirds gender rule. We, my principal says that he actually believes in 50-50. He has not just the two-thirds gender rule, but 50-50. He has already demonstrated it. So for the competition to claim that they have the commitment, where have they demonstrated it? And we have gone beyond that. If you look backwards, and I always tell this story, that when we came from Beijing in 1995, those of us who were in Parliament then were bringing in motions for the implementation of the commitments in Beijing. And I remember my sister, the Honorable Charity Ngilu, Governor of uh, Kitui, and Senator Beth Moore were bringing such motions. On my part, I proposed the Equality Act and the Domestic Violence Bill, which was later to be adopted by the government. But only one man joined us and brought a motion to set up the Gender Equality Commission. Mm -hmm. That man was new to women's issues, runs deep. It's not just about this election. It's something that we practice. And if you look even in Parliament, a majority of the elected women will be from his party. And even now, those running, there is quite a good number. So I'm saying our, demonst uh, our commitment is demonstrated. I don't want to talk about my part because I think that it goes beyond saying. Okay. So we will not only implement the two-thirds gender rule, which is the starting point, but we will go beyond it and that commitment. Tunategemea wa Kenya. Wa Kenya ndi tunategemea kabisa. Kupande ngini kama serikali, tunajua wakati u vijana wetu wa, wengi sana wako na shida mingi zaidi. Na tunataka kuanza kuleta ili ajira mbae na weza ku, ku, ku ajiri vijana wengi zaidi. Kwa mfano kazi mtani. Tuzusema tutarudisha kazi mtani mara moja kama tunaanza. <coughs> yani, <coughs> tukuna kwa kumombo short term, as immediate, mid term and long term. Uh, vijana wetu wengi vile vile wana ujuzi wana wamesoma kwa mpano kwa pande ya ICT wako na ujuzi wengi zaidi na tu, tuko na changamoto kwa sababu ya kutokuwa na ile connectivity ya kutosha haswa katika eneo za mashambani huko tunataka kusambaza ICT ifike kwenye vijiji wetu ili vijana wanaweza ku connect na wanaweza hata kupata ajira kwa 
kampuni ambazo ziko nje ya, ya, ya taifa letu wanaweza kufanya kazi hizo huko vile vile tumesema tunaanza tutaanza hazina mpya ya mkopo pale ambapo vijana wanaweza kwenda kukopesha pesa ya kuanzisha biashara yao na walipi riba yoyote mpaka baada ya miaka saba hayo yote ni vitu ambayo tayari zimeangaliwa na wataalamu wetu na najua inawezekana kufanyika tukuleta mambo kama haya vijana wengi kwanza wataweza kunufaika kwa hiyo mpango lakini muhimu zaidi ni mafunzo tunataka kutupata toa mafunzo kwa vijana wetu ndio sasa tunataka kupanua mativets ziwe uh, katika kila sub county ambayo vijana wanaweza kwenda pale na kupata mafunzo uh, ya uh, aina tofauti tofauti ili waweze kuanzi, kwenda kuanzisha uh, biashara yao yani watu wengi katika taifa letu wanaangalia serikali wengi ukienda mahali wanasema au uh, 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 kabila yetu au uh, kwetu hawajajiriwa uh, katika serikali jajiriwa katika serikali kila mahali mkienda lakini serikali inaweza tu kuajiri watu kadhaa kwa mfano wakati huu ukichukua serikali ya, ya kitaifa yani wale ambao wanaitwa civil servants na atuweke polisi ndani yake na, na jeshi na kadhalika alafu weke hata wale ambao wamejiriwa katika ma counties idadi inakuja na kuwa laki saba peke yake 700000 na hizo nafasi aziko wazi watu wamejiriwa tayari katika hizo nafasi nafasi inatokea kama mtu anakufa au anastaafu na hiyo ni asilimia kumi peke yake kwa mfano inakuwa sabini al, alf kila mwaka ndio kinapatikana kama eh, vacancies lakini kila mwaka sisi kama taifa tunamwaga katika soko la kutafuta kazi watu karibu milioni moja wale ambao wanawaacha shule kwa brasa nane kwa brasa na mbili wengine wanatoka kwa, kwa, kwa ile vituo vingine na chuo kikuu karibu watu milioni moja kwa hivyo mpaka tuangalie sekta ya kibinafsi private sector ndio itaweza kutoa ajira kwa wale vijana wetu wote sisi tunataka kuona kama wa Kenya wenyewe wanapewa fursa ya kuwa kama wa, wa investors wakenya ambao wako hapa na wale ambao wako nje juzi sisi tumekuwa na conference na diaspora wa Kenya tukiwahimiza ya kwamba tutafungua Kenya ili wao wanaweza kuleta pesa zao na kuinvest hapa Kenya kuna vile vile wageni ile kitu inaitwa FDI foreign direct investments pale wanataka kuleta mali zao hapa kuanzisha biashara hapa na kutumia Kenya kama mahali ya kutengeneza bidhaa na kuuza katika soko hii ya kanda ya Afrika Mashariki kuna kuna wafadhili wengi sana wanataka kukuja hapa Kenya uh, wengine basi wanataka kutoka China kutoka nchi zingine waje hapa katika bara ya Afrika sasa shida ambayo iko hapa ni mazingira ya wale kutuleta mali yao hapa. Juzi mimi nilikuwa na wale e, mabalozi na wafanyabiashara kutoka Ulaya. Wanasema makampuni yao kubwa kubwa wangependa sana kuja hapa. Lakini mazingira hapa ya e, kuweka mali yao yao hapa ni sio sawa. Kwa sababu unakuja hapa uh, una kwanza ile kitu inaitwa bureaucracy uh, pili uh, nini uh, corruption iko juu sana 
alafu sasa wengine mtu anakuja hapa amesema yeye anataka kuanzisha kiwanda amenunua shamba kesho mtu mwingine anaenda ile mahakamani nasema hiyo shamba ni yangu maana yake tuko na title deeds mabandia alafu yeye anakwenda anapata injunction kwa court jamaa hawezi kuendelea na kazi yake court hii imefunga hii maneno na hiyo kesi haisikizwi miaka mitatu kesi haijamuliwa juzi ni kutana na America yeye amekuwa hapa sasa kwa miaka mitatu anakuja kesi imeharishwa ati yule jamaa ambaye alienda mahakamani aku ayuko wakili hajakuja mahakama imeharishwa kwa miezi sita ananiuliza mimi Raila hawa jamaa do they know i'm coming from the LA do they know where LA is in this world i'm not going to come again here you see this guy has been wanting to invest in the, in the country but it cannot because somebody who is holding a wrong title deed has gone to court and has got an, an injunction and the matter is not being heard so if you say the judiciary is letting us down creating a very uh, unfriendly environment for investors we, we, we know what you're talking about lakini sisi tunataka to kuingia ndani tufungue maana yake hii itapata italeta ajira mingi kwetu tumesema tunataka kujenga special economic zone ili ya dongo kundu ile kufanya kazi ingine tujenge lamu ingine tujenge huko Kisumu tihari ingine nataka kuweka hapo Voi okay na ina hiyo industrial parks ambao sisi tutaweka ni kama nyeri tutaweka industrial park huko eh kama uh, embu tunafanya namna hiyo garisa na kadhalika tuna tunaweza kuleta vitu ambavyo vitatoa ajira nzuri kwa vijana wetu kwa sababu sisi tuko na mpango mingi sana kwa vijana na kwa akina mama na tunahakika kwamba inawezekana Mheshimiwa Mata kwa kifupi tu uh, Mheshimiwa Raila Odinga amegusia kwamba kila mwaka tunao awasomi awa ambao wanafuzu milioni moja lakini je uh, mrengo wa azimio pengine unalenga kuwa na nafasi ngapi za kazi kila mwaka Nafasi za kazi eh, tunaweza peana figures na ziwe juu au chini lakini vile kina Rawangu amesema ukiangalia sekta ya SME wa sasa ina zaidi ya watu milioni mbili wakipatua masingira sawa sawa ya biashara sababu hata wao wanafinywa na ufisadi ukienda kuuliza license ukienda kufanya nini unaona hata mtu wa welding anaulizwa certificate ya health saa zingine hizo vikwazo zote zinaletwa na ufisadi sikiondolewa kazi zisapatikana nyingi na kasi si za wekezaji wa kutoka nje peke yake ni mazingira ya kila mkenya na ndivyo tuweze kuwa na kazi za kutosha kwa vijana wetu na lazima tujaribu kama wale wanakuja kwa market ya kutafuta kazi ni zaidi ya milioni moja lazima tujaribu tuwe tuone zile kazi zinapatikana zinalingana au zinaongezeka na hii haiwezi fanyika mara moja inafanyika kwa taratibu zile tutaweka na tuko tayari kufanya hiyo yote ampisha hiyo kwa MSMEs yani jua kali sisi tayari tumesema ati tuta tukuwatambua lakini kuwasaidia wao kwa ili waweze kupata mkopo kwa gharama ya chini na bibi tumesema tutaleta ile kitu naitwa uh, shahada ya jitihada recognition of prior learning RPL yani uh, wengine wao hawakuenda kwa shule mpaka wakapata shahada ya shule uh, lakini wameenda wakajifundisha kazi 
wana ujuzi zaidi mwingine anajua kuchoma vyuma yani welder mwingine ni mechanic mwingine ni electrician mwingine ni plumber mwingine ni mason mwingine ni carpenter mwingine anajua kuzeka paa ya nyumba na vigai na kadhalika lakini sasa wakati huu hawezi kupata kandarasi ya serikali kwa sababu hawakuna ile eh, certificate tazizi tuwapatia hiyo certificate ndio tunasema shahada ya jitihada na wakiwa na hiyo wanaweza kupata kandarasi ya serikali bila kupitia kwa mabwanyenye ambayo wananyonyesha jasho lao naam nampisha mwana habari mwenza Nancy Okware kutoka idara ya taifa KBC naam shukrani Uh, Bwana Raila tukirejea kwako ningependa kidogo tuzungumze kuhusiana na swala la afya. Manake tunafahamu ya kwamba uchumi wa taifa hauwezi ukaimarika bila afya bora. Na tumeshuhudia huko nchini wakati ambapo taifa na ulimwengu wanakumbana na janga la COVID-19 na kama azimio la umoja mmezungumza kuhusiana na baba care. Ikiwa mtazamaji anajiuliza pale nyumbani hii baba care kwanza inahusu nini? Tofauti yake na UHC ni ipi na kama azimio la umoja mtatumia mbinu zipi? kutafuta ama kupata zile fedha za kutekeleza. Ya sisi tumesema kwanza sisi tunataka kuboresha hali ya uh, ya ya matibabu katika taifa letu kwa kupanua vituo vya matibabu <coughs> na vile vile kuimarisha. Tunasema tunataka level 4 katika kila sub county ili zisiwe mbali sana na pale watu wanaokuishi kuna wakenya wengi wanapata shida mingi zaidi wa mama haswa ambaye wajawazito wengine wanakufa wako njiani wanapelekwa kwa vituo vya vya matibabu so, ni sababu tunasema tunataka kuijiwe karibu pili tunataka kuna vituo zingine ziko pale lakini hakuna dawa ndani yake <coughs> hakuna vifaa ya, ya, ya matibabu hakuna manases au daktari tunahakikisha <coughs> na kwamba kila kitu cha matibabu imewekwa vizuri imewekwa vifaa vya kutibu watu kuna dawa ndani yake kuna manases na daktari uh, pili tumeongea juu ya bima ya, ya matibabu wanaki wale walileta walileta kufanya tu kama e, 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 experiment waliweka kisumu eh, machakos nyeri na wapi machakos <coughs> kitu ndio kitu yemi sisi tutaweka itakuwa kwa counties zote za za, za, za Kenya na wa Kenya wote watakuwa chini ya bima sawa sawa ya matibabu sio tu ya kufanya majaribio <coughs> watoto wakina mama wazee vijana na tuta vile vile njia ya kuwasaidia kulipa ile premium wale ambaye hawezi kulipa uh, ili kila mtu awe na na cover akiwa mgonjwa anaweza kwenda kwa matibabu na uh, kama hata na pesa apate matibabu sawa sawa uh, vile vile tutajaribu sana kuweka rasilimali katika zile vituo uh, uh, vya matibabu ya hali ya juu wakati huu wakenya wengi wanaenda ngambo sana sana india wengine wanaenda uingereza uh, wanaenda afrika kusini uh, na kadhalika lakini zile vituo tunaweza weka hapa kwetu na sisi tuko na wataalamu wengi Kenya wa Kenya hapa. Ba wamesoma vizuri kabisa wanajua mambo ya matibabu. Yale ambayo inakosekana ni, ni ni vituo. Na pili vile maostali za za, za kibinafsi. Karama iko juu sana. Wengi wa Kenya hawezi kumudu. Gharama ya ya kitanda katika hospitali hizi hapa Nairobi iko juu zaidi kuliko gharama ya, ya kitanda katika eh, five star hoteli. Ulala tu kule hujatibiwa 
gharama ambao wanakulipiza inashinda eh, Hilton au uh, ni Serena eh, hiyo ni kunyonyesha kunyonya wa Kenya na wengi hawezi mtu amekaa kwa hospitali kwa siku chache gharama inafika milioni sikizo nakuta wa Kenya wanakutana jioni uh, Pan African Hotel Nairobi Club jiwapi kwenda kusanya pesa ya matibabu watu wanafanya tu kazi kwa hizi vituo vya matibabu katika taifa letu wananyonyesha wa Kenya sisi tunataka ku kutoa kuleta uhuru kwa wa Kenya kwa kuleta inuwe vituo vya vya kiserikali kwa hali ya juu ili wa Kenya wa kuna chaguo kama utaka kupenda Gakan au Nairobi au wapi unaweza kwenda mahali na utapata madaktari ambaye utatibiwa kwa ile gharama ambayo wewe unaweza kumudu hiyo ndio tunataka kufanya Yeah. Uh, pengine madha tukipata kauli yako kuhusiana na hili swala la afya manake ni wengi ambao wanaathirika unapata kina mama watoto unahisi kama taifa ni vini kipi kilichofanyika tukajipata pale ya kwamba unalipa fedha nyingi baada ya kusalia hospitalini kwa muda mfupi kisha dawa hazipatikani unapata ya kwamba unaambiwa baada ya kutibiwa nenda pale nje kanunue dawa ufisadi umechangia pakubwa dawa zinapelekwa hospitali ya serikali ma hospitali ya county unakuta hata zikiwa zimeletwa juzi juzi hakuna dawa lakini daktari atakwambia ile chemist tutaenda kununua sasa tunashindwa anajuaje ile chemist iko na dawa na si daktari mmoja kutakuwa na mtindo hiyo hospitali utakuwa unaelezewa ni wapi unaenda kwa hivyo ufisadi unachangia pakubwa na ndio tunasema kwa serikali ya azimio tutapambana na ufisadi vilivyo sababu kila mahali kila sekta kila huduma imeadhiriwa uh, pakubwa na ufisadi ningependa wa Kenya wajue wakati tulikuwa tunakuwa tukiwa wadogo na hata nikiwa mpaka university seri, hospitali zile zilikuwa nzuri zaidi hapa nchini ni sa serikali na watu wakigonjeka walikuwa tu wanaenda dispensary wanaenda hospitali kuu nikija hapa kusoma kwa chuo kikuu cha Nairobi city council dispensary zilikuwa ulikuwa unajua ni ipi inafungua 24 hours zilikuwa wazi zilikuwa na dawa zilikuwa na kila kitu wachache sana walikuwa wanaenda hospitali ya kibinafsi tukiboresha katika baba care mahospitali ya serikali hiyo ndiyo italeta bei ya serika, ya hospitali za kibinafsi chini sababu watu watakuwa vile kinara wangu amesema itakuwa hapo wazi unaweza ingia se, hospitali ya serikali upate matibabu poa unaweza enda ya private na kama unaenda ya serikali bila malipo watu wataopt kwenda ya serikali bila malipo lakini iko mambo mengi tutachangia kuboresha kuona wako na vifaa vya kutosha vya kukagua ni, ma, ni matibabu gani na pia ya kufanya um, treatment ndivyo kama ni hiyo matibabu ya kansa inafanya watu sana sana waende India hiyo ni mambo inaweza fanyiwa hapa na zote tukiwa na lengo la kuboresha nchi yetu na serikali ya azimio ikiwa ina mwongozo wa aina hiyo mambo ya matibabu tutaokoa wa Kenya wasiuze mali yao yote wawachwe bila chakula wawachwe bila um, mali ya mambo ingine eh, muhimu wauziwe shamba yao sababu wamechukua mkopo na tuwache kama nchi kupeleka pesa zote zetu ngambo hizo pesa ziboreshe serikali zetu Nam no, Latif. Yeah. We are having a conversation with uh, the Azimio presidential candidate Raila Odinga and his running mate Martha Karua. We're coming to you live from Karen. This is a joint broadcast between several media houses, KTN, Citizen TV, NTV, KBC, K24 and several radio stations. We will have a few minutes to conclude this conversation. So we're going to have some three questions. One of them is around the 
preparation for the August 9th general election and the confidence around it. The other one is on, uh, on management of public debt. And of course, we have to talk about accountability to the public. So I'll start with my colleague, Alan Owino of K24. Okay, well, when you look at the issues surrounding the preparations for elections, this is majorly handled by the commission, which is IBC. And if we remember back in 2017, former Prime Minister, you were in a very precarious situation, especially with your party, and that particular election was nullified. But fast forward to 2022, the very same referee who was actually refing that particular match is still at the very helm of that particular commission going to conduct this year's election. So my question is, what have you done within the five-year period to see to it that you have enough confidence for him to ref this very same match this year? Well, uh, I, I have uh, expressed sometimes my misgivings before, and I've said that um, I want to be convinced that preparations have been done uh, that are above board to ensure a free and fair electoral process. Uh, I did, on the day we were presenting our papers to the Commission, I present them with a, a letter with 10 questions which I wanted them to, to answer. They have partly answered those questions, but uh, there are some other concerns which have not been satisfactory dealt with. But I would say that um, this is premature today because we are having a meeting tomorrow with the IBC, and I will be raising some of these questions there tomorrow. And that's when I will be satisfied or dissatisfied uh, that uh, satisfied that they are pre really prepared and ready for an election uh, which is free and fair or not. So I would actually withhold my my further comment on this issue. Because... I, I would like to make an addition without yeah. going into matters that will be discussed tomorrow. Yeah. And this is directly to fellow Kenyans that we each have a responsibility to make the election free and fair and also credible. The polling clerk, the presiding officer, candidates, supporters, security agencies, we all have a role to play. If each one of us stood up for our country, Kenya, then we would not have complaints in elections. Chebukati and its team sitting at anniversary towers, if everybody else did their work, they would not, even if they wanted, be able to interfere or cause any malpractice. So this is a responsibility we must take joint prosecution. And one party official, if I may add, I had gone to court against for. An appeal is pending. Whether I'll prosecute it or not is another issue. But this is to say to everybody, don't hide behind an institution. When you do wrong, because it's like declaring war against Kenya, Kenyans can come for you. Our constitution does allow it. So let us all do our best, even as we put Chebukati and his team to task tomorrow. Indeed. Is there a particular template, uh, Honorable Odinga, that you have for what constitutes a credible election? Is there a template? What are your immediate concerns? Um, I've seen issues raised on the complementary uh, voter register at the polling stations. Are there what you would say irreducible minimums as you go to this election in terms of how IABC manages it? Well, you know, there are a lot of factors that are contributory to a free and fair electoral process. The, the, the preparations towards it, uh, first, what recruitment of the staff who are going to uh, conduct the, 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 the election themselves. Has it been done in a transparent manner, in a manner that is, does not favor anybody and so on? Secondly, the procurement of the equipment that are going to be used uh, in the election process. Here you have got, right now, the 
uh, electronic or the ICT equipment? How was it procured? And how is it prepared? Uh, and uh, who was involved? And uh, how has it been tested that it is going to work and it's not going to fail? Was the contract itself procured? Where is the guarantee that this printer has not printed some extra ballot papers which can be used to do uh, stuffing, as, as you know, uh, what has happened in the past? Okay? Then uh, the issue of uh, polling stations, uh, where are they and uh, how are they connected in terms, you know, uh, the, the, the cover of uh, 3G or 4G uh, in the country, which are these stations which are not covered and what measures have I be taken to ensure that result from those other ones are actually also uh, uh, made in time. And then the actual polling itself, what uh, arrangements? Like you've got that backup you're talking about, which has become contentious. Mm -hmm. The IBC is insisting that you don't need a, a manual register. And people are saying that in, there's no harm in having a manual register as a, a counter check. Uh, so that when somebody comes, and is identified electronically, you also delete his name on the new register. That gives you the, the number, eventually you can, through what, the numbers which you have crossed, know how many people have gone through that polling station. So that eventually, when wrong results come out, if 100 people voted, but then eventually 200 are announced, you can counter check from the, that register. To, to, to confirm that indeed what has the number which has come out is the number which uh, voted here. They are saying they don't want to see that. The harm that that causes to them, nobody knows. Mm -hmm. that, 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 that is their only issue. Mm -hmm. So um, um, basically the, the, the overall preparation of the election in, in that manner uh, and then the, the security, uh, where, you know, um, who is going to provide security so that voters don't get harassed by some other goons, because the, the, and other op opponents can hire goons to block mm -hmm. opponents from, from going to, 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 to vote. Mm -hmm. uh, who are those who are going to be in charge of security neutral enough to ensure that everybody is facilitated to cast his or her vote without coercion or, or interference. Okay? Then uh, counting and uh, that's on the polling day. Because what we have had is not that we have not had agents in some areas. There are some areas where uh, the agents are actually given two options, uh, thrown out, mm -hmm. so that you don't have an agent there. Mm -hmm. See? Mm -hmm. Where is the guarantee that this is not Because the police are also complicit there. And that's why you usually have this uh, complaint. And then you have, you know, the, 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 the electronic system. Mm -hmm where, you know, you are identified through your uh, biometrics and uh, the irises and then you are allowed to go and vote. Eventually, the results are counted, uh, recorded, and then the, the presiding officer is supposed to, once the, the agents have signed, press the button and to the server at, at uh, at um, uh, Bomas. But then uh, there is a logarithm that they put in which was. So we had situations where our agent in the stations are giving us different results, and the results are being announced. Then you had two parallel lines running like this 54 44. 54 44. I lost with 44. My governor in Nairobi, 
5444 in Kajiado, 5444 in Garissa, 5444 in... Uh, uh, in as we conclude the conversation, your competition has actually challenged you many times publicly. William Ruto saying, should he lose this election, he's prepared to concede defeat. Are you prepared to make the same commitment to the country? Definitely. Definitely. I'm the sportsman between me and him. And I know that as you kubali kushindwa, shum shindani. So I, I would easily accept uh, defeat and congratulate the winner. Definitely. Asante sana. Maybe as we, as we depart, um, the, the, the Raila Karua ticket, um, how is it going so far? You've not always worked in the same team together. In 2007, you're in different teams. Um, uh, in fact, my Honorable Mother, you're on record saying at one point you didn't see anything ideological that you shared with the Honorable Raila. Is it now a union of convenience for this election? What does your ticket now bring to the fore? And tied to that, um, what are your chances? Have you figured out what are your chances uh, for winning this election? I think I should go first yes, now please. that you mentioned me. Mm -hmm. Remember, we were competitors in 2013. And if you are competitors, you go for it and you go for your competition. That is the only time we strictly were not on the same side. We've come from the same background, from the trenches fighting for expanded democracy. That doesn't mean when you are on the same side you must see everything 100% the same way. In 2005, we were on opposing sides of the constitutional, um, the banana orange. orange yeah. And 2007, we were again not Team together. We worked together. Now but Kenya we came together in the national court. So we've worked together more than we've worked separately. We both come from a social uh, justice background. We both root for social justice. In fact, the manifesto, when, because I found it in the making when I was named, I would have said, easily said it was made for now Kenya. We have more in common than separates us. And this is not just for convenience, it is for the sake of Kenya. We are in a very dangerous place where we can lose all that we have built. What we need in Kenya today is good leadership that can take the nation forward. I joined my principal to do just that, rescue our nation. I just want to, want to compliment what you just said. <laughs> yes. But you know, from the days of Ford, yeah. we were together. Mm. See, Mother only left Ford at the time of nominations mm -hmm. because of male chauvinism, which we need in nominations when in our constituency. Details are record there. But then we came and team together in, in Parliament. Mm. Uh, she came through DP which was in the position together with Ford Asili and Ford Kenya. And we worked very closely together uh, throughout that period. In 2002, we were together in uh, NAC. We were together in NAC, and we campaigned together throughout the, that period of time. And then we went to government together, and we were ministers in the same, same government. We worked very closely in the cabinet. It was only the constitution uh, bombers where we had differences. And then uh, uh, 2007. But then after that, we again worked in the, in the same NAC government. So we have worked together more than we, we have worked uh, uh, apart. And, and um, as she says rightly, politics, Sometimes you, you, you disagree in interpretation on, on issues. That does not make you enemies. You, so long as you, know, you, have, you have the same beliefs. We believe in, in human rights issues, believe in multipartism, believe in democracy, you know, liberal society, 
uh, that gives opportunity to his people and so on. So we share much more in common with mother um, than many people have worked with. <laughs> wewe si mradi wa rais Uhuru Kenyatta. Pengine rais Uhuru Kenyatta atakuwa na mchango upi ndani ya serikali yako? <laughs> rais Uhuru Kenyatta anamaliza tamu yake. Yeye mwenyewe amesema anamaliza anataka kwenda kupumzika. Na mimi tumeongea na yeye, nimesema yeye amechangia ame, 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 amefanya kazi yake. Uh, Umekuwa na changamoto kwa, kwa, kwa serikali yake mnajua lakini nafikiri amejaribu uh, vile angeweza ang, kufanya manake vile waliingia katika serikali katika hali walikuwa washtakiwa kule ICC hiyo ilikuwa ni changamoto kubwa sana lakini tofauti na hayo walijaribu tukaja sasa kwa hiyo ya pili tumekuta na yeye ye mwenyewe alikiri ya kwamba kulikuwa na makosa hapa na pale lakini tu sawa yaliyopita tufanye kazi pamoja na mwenyewe amejaribu ingawaje yeye 